Crosstrek with stunning design, innovative technology, and premium safety features. You'll enjoy the journey in the Subaru Crosstrek while exploring city streets or the open road. Thanks to our friends at McGrath Evanston Subaru. Enter at WTTW.com slash sweepstakes or call 773-509-1111 extension 2 today. Programming on WTTW is made possible in part by viewers like you and by the following. We are Smith Senior Living, and we want you to be Smith Smart about your future. Position yourself to be able to do the things you enjoy. Have a plan as you age, where you're going to live and for your care. That's Smith Smart. Smith Senior Living operates two beautiful and modern communities, Smith Village in Chicago's Beverly neighborhood and Smith Crossing in South Suburban Orland Park. Be Smith Smart. Visit smithseniorliving.org, an equal opportunity housing provider. Whatever your style, a Walter E. Smith designer can deliver. We're not just one look, we're your look. And if this isn't it, we'll find it. Our design services are free and based on your budget. Still not it? Our clients deserve the very best, and our designers aren't done until you love it. Not it? You dream it, we design it, until it's it. Meet with a Smith designer today, at your home or in our showroom. WTTW programming originates from the Rene Crown Public Media Center. Hi, I'm Catherine from Bronzeville, and you're watching WTTW. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight. You very often have no debates, which is really the, the worst thing of all. The debate over debates. What's behind the trend of candidates saying no to sharing their stage with their opponents? We've claimed that we want to see second chance and redemption stories. Give people a chance. How people with criminal records are hoping to get a second chance in our fourth and final installment of Permanent Punishment strong interest and need to make sure that we bridge that gap. Plans for a state-of-the-art cancer center in Hyde Park. That and more in tonight's In Your Neighborhood series. Chicago is seeing the lowest number of new HIV cases since the 1980s, but some groups are still greatly impacted by the disease. Chicago gets the best big city in the U.S. vote for the sixth year in a row. We dig into the reasons why. And you might have noticed that along with our new studio, we have a new theme song. We sit down with the composer. And Brandis in Paris, as you mentioned, I'm in Hyde Park while I'll be reporting live tonight as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. It's a neighborhood with a history of many notable residents and cultural institutions and a notable new neighbor on the way in the form of the Obama Presidential Center, which comes with a lot of excitement as well as anxiety. We'll talk about all of that and much more coming up, but for now, back to you. Thanks, Nick. And now to some of today's top stories. President Biden announces major executive actions on marijuana that could affect thousands who are incarcerated for possession. The president today announced he will pardon all of those convicted of federal simple marijuana possession. Biden says he's also asking governors to do the same for state-level offenses and says the federal government will look to reclassify marijuana, which is currently a drug classified at the same level of serious drugs like heroin. Marijuana, of course, is already legal in Illinois and several other states, and many records here have been expunged. Now, this move comes on the same day that the Washington Post is reporting that federal agents believe they have enough evidence to federally charge the president's son, Hunter Biden, with tax and gun purchase offenses. The number of Chicagoans newly diagnosed with HIV and AIDS in 2020 was at its lowest in four decades. That's according to a new report today from the Chicago Department of Public Health. 
A total of 627 HIV diagnoses were reported in 2020 in Chicago, while 269 Chicagoans were diagnosed with AIDS, which is the most advanced stage of the HIV infection. And of course, we'll have more on this later in the program. O'Hare will become one of five national airports that will be designated as enhanced screening sites for Ebola. Passengers traveling from Uganda will be sent to O'Hare or one of the other four airports for screening. This as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has reported a slight outbreak of the deadly virus in that African country. There are no confirmed cases outside of Uganda reported at this time. One of Chicago's two major daily newspapers will now be free to read online. The Chicago Sun-Times announced today that it is removing its paywall for online content, but still asking readers to voluntarily subscribe or to donate. Now, this move comes after the paper merged with the Chicago Public Media to form a new joint nonprofit. The Sun-Times will still charge for its print edition. And coming up next in the program, a new report on the decline of HIV diagnoses across Chicago. But first, the hurdles people face when it comes to clearing criminal records. That's in our fourth and final installment of Permanent Punishment, right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. This week, our Permanent Punishment series explored the various ways people with criminal records are limited. There are ways to get around them, to clear a record, but those methods can be cumbersome and difficult to access, and some advocates say they're not nearly enough. King Musa raps about what he knows. At the age of 14, he was charged as an adult with murder a gun deal gone bad. Though he was sentenced to 25 years in prison, he spent 13. The reason he's at this rally rapping about his experience today, he calls a miracle. A CEO knocks on my door and he's like, um, uh, you don't want to go home? We've been trying to get an address from you all day. And I'm like, what? You serious? What you mean, go home? King Musa, whose given name is Brian Harrington, had been granted something only a small minority of Illinois prisoners have ever received, clemency. It commuted his sentence and released him from prison. What clemency didn't do was clear his record. I'm trying to get home now. When I see the house, I view the house and everything seems good and, and then nothing happens, you know? And I, I can only believe that it's because of my record. Uh, um, I've definitely applied for certain jobs and I've had to tell employers like, first because they ask is there anything that's going to pop up it's like yeah there's a felony murder that might pop up though there are about 1300 permanent punishments on the books in illinois and countless more that aren't there's only a handful of ways to get around them often involving a complicated mix of paperwork and expenses one of them is executive clemency granted only by the governor in jb pritzker's case 151 times since early 2021 but the process is lengthy, murky, and unpredictable. You write a petition that goes to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board, which then it gets heard by them. You don't get to know what their recommendation is, whether it's up or down, and then it gets sent to the governor's office only if it's a positive recommendation from the Prisoner Review Board, and then the governor decides on your clemency petition. Julie Beale is a clinical law professor and director of the Children and Family Justice Center at Northwestern Law. What are your thoughts on like the opacity of that process for clemency? Well, it bums me out. It's very frustrating to not know. Executive clemency can come in the form of a pardon from the governor, which can restore all or some rights lost due to the conviction. Or clemency can commute a prison sentence like King Musa's. A separate option is record sealing. Celia Colon, who we met Tuesday, was convicted of attempted murder and armed robbery 26 years ago. She had her records sealed. Got my records sealed because of all of the no's in regards to trying to get employment, um, being turned down from just about everything. You can't rent an Airbnb with a record. A record is sealed. Uh, that means that only law enforcement 
and certain governmental agencies can see it. To have it done is incredibly complicated. You have to get your rap sheet. You have to fill out the right forms. You, and if you don't fill out the right form, they throw you out of court. Then the state can object. And for Cologne, record sealing wasn't enough. So today actually makes a year and a half. She's been gone. She died November 20th, a day before her birthday. She's 35 years old. Her sister was murdered two years ago. Cologne wants to become legal guardian of her children. She has two beautiful children, but due to my conviction, I'm not allowed to get custody of them. I was told that somebody else in my family who doesn't have a record should try to apply for full custody. The Illinois Probate Act says, quote, a person who is qualified to act as guardian has not been convicted of a felony unless the court finds appointment of the person convicted of a felony to be in the minor's best interest. Cologne feels clemency, a pardon from the governor, is her best chance. The reason I want a clemency is I want to have custody of my sister's children. I want to have all my civil rights back. I don't have all my civil rights. And it doesn't matter that the case occurred over 26 years ago. So clearing the record allows you access to a world of things. You still have to explain what you did with this black hole of time. <laughs> you know, you got, you got to figure out something. Uh, but people tend to do better <laughs> when, they, when they don't have a record. Another option to work around the permanent punishments, expungement. You can petition the court to have your records expunged. Now expungement means it is ripped up. It is destroyed. That's what's supposed to happen. But expungement only applies in certain cases. If you have a criminal conviction, you cannot have your record expunged. You can, however, have it sealed. The record sealing or expungement process includes filing a petition in court, costing around $157 per charge. Fees that add up if you've got more than one charge, but can be waived if you're at or below 125% of the poverty level. Psychologist and former Cook County Jail Warden Nika Jones Tapia says it's still a barrier and argues for some sort of automatic expungement process. What research has shown us is that even though Illinois has one of um, the best systems for expungement and sealing, not many people utilize it. Where we shift the burden of the individual petitioning for sealing of records or expungement from the individual to the system. That will help us to make this expungement process and sealing process more equitable. Hazelcrest Police Chief Mitchell Davis, the first black man to serve as president of the Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police, says he can get behind the idea of automatic expungement with some guardrails. Low level, nonviolent crimes should be consideration for some type of automatic expungement, but there, it needs to be contingent upon uh, meeting certain criteria, not just, you know, okay, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're done, but, you know, no, no further arrests, you know, so a certain time period and maybe some other things that, that would fit the criteria. We're just trying to build a network of power, you know what I'm saying? Let people know that we could make the change. These days, in addition to his music, King Musa teams up with Marlon Chamberlain, who we met on Monday. The two work on the Fully Free campaign, an effort to unroll some of the state's 1,300 laws that hinder people with records from moving forward. Because knowing that they have that on their background, it's hard for people to find jobs Absolutely. and vote and stuff sure. like that. Yeah. Today, they're making sure people know that they still have the right to vote once they're out of prison, a right that only 18 states, including Illinois, fully restore upon release. So when it comes to permanent punishment, it's like, why? <laughs> why do I got to continue to pay debt to society the rest of my life? That does the opposite of what we claim we want to see in America. We claim that we want to see second chance to redemption stories, give people a chance. And getting old legislation changed and new laws introduced is a role these two men say they take seriously. Who else but us should be writing laws fighting poverty? Not just for themselves, but for the hundreds of thousands of others. We don't believe that a conviction should follow anyone for life, no matter the conviction. 40 free! When I say free, say 40 free! 40. And Nika jones Tapia, who you've heard from in this series, points out that even though the state has records sealing and expungement for people with records, not enough people access it.
The Paper Prisons Initiative says in Cook County alone, 511,000 people are eligible for some sort of records relief like sealing or expungement. But in 2021, just under 6,000 people statewide took advantage of it. At that rate, Paper Prisons estimates it'd take 154 years to clear what they call the second chance gap. And now, Paris, back to you. Brandis, thank you very much. Early voting begins in Chicago tomorrow, but by one measure, voters have fewer opportunities to be informed about the positions of those on the ballot. That's because there are fewer debates these days. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with more. Amanda, this has been going on all across the country at every level. Yeah, Paris, and we'll get into that. You know, it's almost as if that there is a debate between candidates about debates. You and I both know the magic and the power of television. John Kennedy and Richard Nixon learned it too back in 1960 for the first famous presidential debate. Former FCC Chair Newt Minow was involved with that and every presidential debate since. He says debates present voters with a rare opportunity to get a true feel for candidates without advisors whispering in their ears. It's the only time when you can see both candidates live uh, without uh, their advisors uh, who make their commercials where they have to answer tough questions and uh, you and and show that they have the brains and the fortitude and the personality that the voters will want to vote for before we go forward, do want to disclose that Minow was a former chair of the board here at WTTW and has long served on that. Now, as he was talking about a chance really for candidates to show voters what they are, but voters are not getting that chance anymore because some candidates, they're not taking part in debates. We heard the national GOP earlier saying they wouldn't take place in the presidential debates. Uh, so how widespread is this trend? You know, I, I posed that very question to Cornell College Department Chair of Politics, Megan Goldberg. She couldn't give an exact answer. She says political scientists have studied the effect of debates and haven't actually found a huge impact on voting outcomes, largely because if you bother to tune into one, you're probably already a well-informed voter. But the prevalence of skipping them is a different matter. It's like when you uh, turn on a Cubs game to like root for your team. It's sort of the same effect when people tune into debates. Um, so we know a lot about the effects and we know that they're somewhat small in some ways because of who the actual audience is. Um, but we haven't done a ton of research on what goes into um, who decides to debate because there wasn't always that much variation. But politicos are noticing this trend nationally. It looks like there will be no debates in the competitive contests for the governor of Arizona and U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania and Georgia because at least one of the major party candidates in each of those races won't commit to doing one. And as you noted, the Republican National Committee this year voted to withdraw from the Commission on Presidential Debates, citing bias. Now here in Illinois, the Republican candidate for treasurer has tried to make hay of his opponent's participation in debates or lack thereof, and the challenger for Cook County Board trying to make it an issue as well. The Tribune recently reported about the Lake County League of Women Voters complaints about a break in tradition with various candidates rejecting or ignoring their forum invitations. What's behind this, Amanda? I mean, you'd think that candidates want to get out there, want to get their positions in front of the public. Yeah, Paris, there are any number of reasons for that, including complaints about ground rules. Some refuse to share the stage because candidates say they don't want to give legitimacy to an opponent's what they view to be controversial views. And then wealthy candidates, they can just bypass debates and instead air curated commercials. We are deluged at all levels now with purchased radio and television commercials which are simply not true and which lie and, and this is true of both both parties professor goldberg also says that especially in the social media age campaigns make careful calculations is it worth the potential cost of getting backed into an uncomfortable corner and having that have its sort of viral internet moment, um, you know, versus the perks of potentially getting in and what what goes viral now, like a dunk on your on your opponent? If you're way ahead, candidates may not want to put themselves in a spot to screw that up.
if one candidate is running way ahead, that candidate doesn't want a debate, doesn't want to risk uh, a, a mistake or uh, anything happening. So you very often have no debates, which is really the, the worst thing of all. That is not the case for the marquee race here in Illinois. Democrat J.B. Pritzker and Republican Darren Bailey did face off virtually, anyway, in a newspaper forum last week. But candidates for governor will only debate on TV twice, including tonight. WTTW has hosted forums virtually every election cycle for governor, but Bailey never responded to our invite. Pritzker cited scheduling conflicts despite several months' notice and weeks of date options that we gave the campaign. Another neither of them appeared in the primaries either, but we will be hosting other forums here in Chicago tonight. Yeah, Paris, we certainly will. Leading up to November 8th, we're going to have matchups featuring the candidates for U.S. Senate, for Secretary of State, and for Attorney General. Minow says voters want and need to be educated and, and informed. The whole idea of democracy, the whole concept is that we have informed voters who exercise their judgment to choose their leaders. That's the whole essence of the, of the democratic system. Goldberg says a lack of debates could impact democracy in myriad ways, even if folks don't actually watch the debates live. What's said in these forums becomes part of a candidate's record, and so then it has a more lasting impact on both the race and then whoever's elected Some, as well. Sometimes they wind up in campaign commercials, uh, and Amanda, we should mention that there is still time for the gubernatorial candidates to accept our invitation yes, here at WTTW <laughs> for our forum. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hyde Park on Chicago's south side is well known as a diverse community with a long history of notable residents and wide array of cultural offerings. It's home to the DeSable Museum, the Museum of Science and Industry, and of course the University of Chicago. And in the coming years, it'll have a high profile neighbor in the form of the Obama Presidential Center. So as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series, reporter Nick Blumberg and producer Acacia Hernandez spent the day in Hyde Park and Nick joins us now. Nick. Well, Paris, Hyde Park also has a commercial corridor that's seen big changes with more to come. We're along that corridor inside the Sophie Hotel, our thanks for shelter from the rain. Now, 53rd Street is also home to many locally owned businesses, nightlife spots, and restaurants. There's been some turnover during COVID, but a lot of these small businesses have hung on, even though they're still facing challenges. The local Chamber of Commerce says staffing shortages mean some restaurants are only open for dinner or not open all week. And then to balance that against customers, whether or not you have a lot of customers coming in and you can support the amount of customers that want to come in and eat. And the retail shops are kind of in that same boat too. It's a matter of uh, they're open. They would love to have more people walking in. Uh, I would have to say I see more people all over Chicago wearing masks again. Now, health and safety are still a concern for Jaw Grill. They're known for Jamaican fare like jerk chicken and salmon escovitch. General Manager Alex Fowler says they're still feeling the squeeze from the pandemic. Recovery has just been a little challenge in regards to uh, our, our to-go, our takeout, uh, also our dine in uh, We're not fully back to capacity, uh, and that's just something we want to do to make sure we keep our staff and our patrons safe as well. Now, Jag Grill started in Lincoln Park, but it moved to Hyde Park eight years ago. Fowler says it's been a welcoming community with a lot of attractions that bring people in to eat and drink at his and many other local restaurants. It's really wonderful to be a part of Hyde Park. It's uh, the home of the University of, of Chicago, uh, Obama. The new Obama Foundation is about to be opening the library. Uh, there's just a lot of, uh, lot of shopping, a lot of eating, uh, just a lot of things to do around the neighborhood. And it's, it's all within uh, about a four block radius as well. Mallory Price of the Hyde Park Historical Society is also, no surprise, a big booster for the community. She says people sometimes overlook the neighborhood, but that they're missing out on its culture. The society organizes a book club with local authors. It's planning a self-guided architecture tour of notable buildings. Price says she's never felt more at home anywhere else. It is such a rich and engaging place with so many interesting people and I think that it has taught me to live with awe and to pay attention to the, <laughs> to the community and to the people around me because there is so many fascinating people and so much history here. 
Now, part of that history, the society has been working to preserve is at Oakwood Cemetery in nearby Greater Grand Crossing, the resting place of many notable Hyde Park residents and other Chicagoans, Harold Washington, Ida B. Wells, members of the Staples musical family. But Price says there was a history of discrimination at Oakwoods. There was discrimination even in cemetery and burial practices, and we want to like highlight the stories of of many influential African Americans who were denied burial there and also people who were able um, to finally really advocate and fight um, to have that cemetery integrated. As Price and her colleagues work to document the community's past, there's a lot of change in its future. Of course, the much publicized Obama Presidential Center with all the excitement and controversy that's come with it. There's also the University of Chicago's plans for a dedicated cancer care center, which it says would be the first of its kind in the state and one that would be especially important to this part of Chicago. When we look at cancer rates, cancer stage, and cancer survival, for people on the south side of Chicago, it is as poor as some countries that have very limited resources. And, you know, there's a very uh, strong, strong interest and need to make sure that we bridge that gap. I think education, access to care, partnership, these are all the things that a, a freestanding cancer center can provide. That cancer center is still a few years away, as is the Obama Center, but Phil Moy and other community leaders are hopeful about the hundreds of thousands of projected visitors it will bring. He says despite the challenges of the last couple of years, things are looking up, especially for small businesses. A lot of our new members have been smaller businesses, so I think the small startup businesses are very uh, excited about opening up in Hyde Park. I think that their enthusiasm is, is a good sign. Now, coming up, we'll hear from one of Hyde Park's older people as well as an affordable housing advocate. But for now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Nick. HIV diagnoses in 2020 were the lowest reported since the late 80s. That's according to the Chicago Department of Public Health's latest HIV and STI data report. But while cases are dropping overall, young black and Latino Chicagoans are seeing a disproportionate number of new diagnoses compared to other groups. So how can public health officials better reach people more greatly impacted? And joining us to discuss all of that and more are Dr. Irina Tabidze, Director of Program Operations at the Chicago Department of Public Health Syndemic Infectious Disease Bureau, and Dr. Aniruda Hazra, an assistant professor specializing in infectious diseases and global health at the University of Chicago. Welcome both of you here uh, to Chicago tonight. Dr. Tabidze, I'll start with you and this report put out by the health department. So the lowest amount of new diagnoses at 627 in 2020, and that's the lowest amount since 1988. What accounts for that? Uh, actually, thank you for having me today. Uh, so this is the first time ever since the beginning of the epidemic when we reported the lowest number of the cases. If we will compare to the numbers of the cases in 2020, overall it's a 64% decrease in the number of reported new HIV cases. It's, a, it's not only decrease, what is really exciting is that decreases are seen across all races, ethnicities, across age groups, as well as uh, genders. Most importantly, I would like to know that we see decreases by 30% among non-Hispanic blacks as well as Hispanic and by 47% decreases by, uh, among the non-Hispanic whites. Uh, what, what it's really important to note is that this is the first report we're releasing post-COVID era. So this is the data which was collected uh, during the COVID era. And, and we need to be cautious when we interpret the mm -hmm. data because it's very well possible that some numbers were underreported. So, but as of right now, we are very happy to report this is the first time ever that Chicago Department of Public Health uh, reported the lowest number. Dr. Hazra, do, do you think that some of this is attributed to better outcomes and not just under reporting due to COVID? Yeah, I think the, the two are all kind of intertangled together. Uh, I think uh, we should really like celebrate that we're seeing such a drop in cases, but also proceed with caution, that we know that there was a steep decline in cases uh, during the COVID pandemic and or the early parts of the COVID pandemic, which is obviously obviously implicating uh, the number of cases we're seeing. But regardless, you know, as we see testing start to improve, we're still seeing that those cases not rising the same proportion that we have in years past. All right, Dr. Tabita, let's break down uh, by demographic group uh, in this study. So the report finds that black Chicagoans make up the majority of new HIV cases at nearly 55 percent. 
23%, and then Latino Chicagoans at 23%, uh, white Chicagoans at 11%. And then by neighborhood, the highest uh, rates were found in Fuller Park, Uptown, and Pullman. So is the through line here that the more economically disadvantaged the area, the higher likelihood of a higher rate of HIV AIDS? Uh, yes and no. So most of the cases actually are distributed. If we look at the trends overall with distribution of the cases by race, ethnicity, by community areas of the Chicago, actually you would notice that some of the cases are not only located, not only, this is the highest number of the cases that you reported in the south on the west side of the city. However, if we look at the prevalent HIV cases, most of the cases are located on the north side of the mm. city. So it's really important to distinguish. Yes, it's, I, I would like to add that if we look at the, this report, as you mentioned, outlines not only HIV cases, but also provides the data on sexual transmitted infections, such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And the reason I mentioned that the distribution of the cases, if we look at the STIs in comparison to HIV, that we will notice that, for example, gonorrhea and chlamydia are mostly on the south and west side of the areas in the hard economic hardship areas of the city. Okay, so there's a definite trend with those the, STIs it, and, and the more economically disadvantaged Exactly. Uh, Dr. Hauser, I want to get to another uh, metric here. Uh, this study found that 61% uh, of people living with HIV achieved viral suppression in 2020. That's an increase from 50% the year before. Or what does that mean? What's the significance? Yeah, so virological suppression is really sort of the, uh, the way that we can help uh, have people who are living with HIV live long and healthy lives, but then also reduce transmission. That folks who are virologically suppressed cannot transmit HIV uh, to their partners or, or anyone around them. Uh, and so virological suppression is really a goal that we have as, you know, uh, as a public health message that works in both directions, keeping people healthy while also reducing sort of transmissions downstream. So again, 61% is a number that is really great to see, but also the flip side is that 40% are not virologically suppressed. So we have to continue, if we're really looking to end this HIV epidemic in the city of Chicago, we really have to focus on that 40% and realizing what are the challenges and obstacles that population needs to face in order to get to, uh, to be suppressed in a place where they can remain healthy and their communities can remain healthy. And, and Dr. Tavita, I assume that mu much of this is access to care. So there's, there's a statistic in here saying that 71% of those uh, diagnosed accessed medical care, 41% retained care, meaning they had multiple uh, appointments in, in, in a certain uh, time period. Uh, is this about uh, access and and whether or not you have uh, treatment options available to you. So uh, numbers that you cited, this is for number for individuals who, uh, this is for prevalent HIV cases, this is for people living with HIV, and you're absolutely right. So one of the reasons could be this access to care. And we need to be careful uh, uh, and remember that 2020, you know, some of the clinics were closed, there were lockdowns, yeah. and some individuals might chose not to go see a doctor. And so, and one of the things I wanted to mention, the CDPH supported use of telehealth which was a tremendous help for healthcare providers as well as individuals diagnosed with HIV because uh, so, so care could be provided through telehealth. Mm -hmm. So not only physically going and see a doctor. And another thing, you know, as the clinics were closed, as I mentioned, and or reduced the number of the appointments that allowed individuals to see uh, physicians or their primary care provider. And Dr. Hazra, Illinois has this goal of getting to zero by 2030. How does this study fit in with that goal? I mean, it, really helps us on that trajectory that you know we're heading in the right direction uh, similar to other major cities in the United States like New York City or San Francisco that have made major headway in thinking about uh, their approach to uh, controlling HIV or really eliminating HIV uh, amongst their communities and a lot of has to do that we've talked about social determinants of health that we can have the best HIV medicine in the world world-class institutions in the city but if folks can't get to that care for whatever reason then it's really not uh, has any worth so really a lot of it is trying to determine what are the biggest obstacles that are preventing people from engaging in care uh, among healthcare providers, et cetera, and trying to figure out what are those exact problems and figuring out innovative solutions of the city. Common theme we see not in, in just in this, but public health issues like COVID uh, and nearly every other uh, thing in this area. All right, uh, Dr. Arena Tabidze and Dr. Aniruda Hadza, thank you so much. Thank you. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Pierce, thank you. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, we're one-on-one -on -one with one of Hyde Park's local aldermen on new developments in the area, plus more from our In Your Neighborhood series. If you're looking for another reason to brag about Chicago, find out why Chicago is ranked best big city in the U.S. for the sixth year in a row. Plus, composer Aisha Ish Dominguez sits down to talk to us about her inspiration for our new theme music. But first, some more of today's top stories. 
President Biden announces major executive actions on marijuana that could affect thousands who are incarcerated for possession. The president today announced he'll pardon all those convicted of federal simple marijuana possession. Biden says the federal government will look to reclassify marijuana. It's a drug that is currently classified at the same level of serious drugs like heroin. Marijuana, of course, is already legal in Illinois and several other states, and many records here have been expunged. Faculty and staff at the City Colleges of Chicago vote to authorize a strike. 92% of members with Cook County College Teachers Union voted yes to authorize a strike. However, it doesn't guarantee that a walkout will happen. They are negotiating with City Colleges of Chicago for higher wages and more teaching support. Their contracts expired in July. Cook County President Tony Preckwinkle is proposing an $8.75 billion budget for the next fiscal year. Preckwinkle's office says the budget closes an $18 million gap without raising taxes. It credits higher than expected revenue figures for the balanced budget. Among the priorities, using the county's federal funding relief are $170 million over the next three years for Cook County Health for a range of initiatives, but especially for those populations disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. A $70 million investment in small businesses, which will provide $10,000 grants to 7,000 businesses. And $42 million for a guaranteed income pilot, applications for which opened today through October 21st. And Chicago voters can start casting their ballots as early as tomorrow. Two downtown sites open tomorrow at 9 a.m. for early voting, one at 100 and 191 North Clark and the other at the Board of Elections office at 69 West Washington. Early voting in all 50 wards begins later on October 24th. And if you like to wait, Election Day is, of course, on November 8th. You can find more information on our website. And now to Nick Blumberg, who spent the day in Hyde Park as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Nick. Brandis, we're joined now by Alderman Leslie Hairston of the Fifth Ward. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Good evening. Uh, so we've been talking with folks, you know, all day and yesterday as well about the, the excitement and the anxiety that come along with the Obama Presidential Center. What are your hopes for, you know, what that can mean in terms of development, but also keeping an eye on making sure folks don't get displaced by that? Well, we started early on. We started early on engaging with the community, um, you know, talking, uh, meeting with residents, meeting with different organizations, different groups, meeting with the Obama Presidential Center, the foundation. Um, and we've made sure that we've kept those conversations going. I have monthly ward meetings. Uh, someone from the foundation is present at each and every meeting to keep people abreast, to answer any questions should they arise. Um, I think it's really exciting to see something arising um, out of the ground, to see the cranes in the air and say yes. This is the South Side, and this is for us. You know, another uh, South Side, long time, uh, well loved uh, gem of the South Side. It's Promontory Point, which you've been a big advocate for uh, preserving that. Where does that project stand right now? Well, I think we, we the community wants it to be um, declared a landmark. Um, and so we are moving forward with that. I hope that we can get the support of the City of Chicago and the Chicago Park District to get that done. So you're joining us this evening after the first marathon day of the city's budget hearings. Yes. Obviously a lot of attention being paid to the fact that uh, in this election year budget there will be no property tax increase, which folks are very excited about. What's your take on, on the mayor's proposal? Well, I think, you know, one of the things is that, of course, people are really happy, but people are also very unsure about where we're going, where the economy's going, what's happening with gas prices, what's happening with housing prices. So these are all things that we looked at. And what I heard from our colleagues today is that while we are in a position where we can make decisions, let's make good decisions now so that uh, when, if and when something happens that we're able to not have to scramble like we did when COVID-19 hit us and realize that the city, that we did not have the appropriate technology to shift. Um, and so a lot of, I've heard from a lot of my colleagues talking about wanting to, a return of the Department of Environment. Um, you know, looking at what happened in Florida, looking at what's happened here in the city of Chicago, it's important that we be ahead of the game um, instead of behind the eight ball. 
Yeah, are there some specific priorities? I mean, you, you mentioned the challenges of COVID, of trying to pivot to technology, you know, with, with some aldermanic office staff. They feel limited. They're, it might not be quite so easy to do with the folks you've got working for you. Well, well, we are limited because we only have a certain amount to run our office, and, and you know, the city only gives us a limited amount. So we only also only have a staff of three. So if you've got two people on Zoom and each of the city departments is posting on their website, you don't have that. Then you've got to answer the phones, you've got to answer emails. It's very difficult to do with three. You are uh, one of the folks who is uh, calling it quits after this current term of the city council. Why was now the, the right time to move on to your next chapter? I've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, you know, I love what I do. I love my job. I love my community. Uh, but I think now I want to be active and involved and be more focused on development in the community and community development um, as opposed to settling squabbles. All right. Well, hopefully not too many squabbles in your future. We appreciate your time tonight. Alderman Leslie Hairston. Thank you. And coming up, we'll hear more from Hyde Park with a longtime resident and affordable housing advocate. But for now, back to you. Nick, thank you. Move over New York and L.A. because Chicago keeps topping the list for best big city in the U.S. Now for a sixth year in a row. More than 240,000 Condé Nast traveler readers from all over the country rank Chicago as their favorite city to visit. But what makes Chicago so special? Besides the fact that you and I are here because joining us right now is the president and CEO of Choose Chicago, Lynn Osmond. Welcome to the studio. It is good to have you here. So we're showing our bias a little bit, but why is Chicago the number one city? Chicago has so much to offer, and that was, was really interesting by the Condé Nast rankers. Uh, they talked about, first of all, the Midwest hospitality, how much our hospitality workers and our residents, how much they greeted people, and then also the diversity of what we have to offer. You know, we have incredible lakefront parks, these incredible arts and culture institutions, and we have our wonderful sports teams, our fabulous architecture, uh, just so the incredible restaurants, high-ranked hotels. So we have it all, and the Condé Nast readers really like that. Six years running, what are the odds? Never before. 35 years this uh, award has been given out, and nobody has ever received it six years in a row. So that is quite amazing. That's impressive. Um, so, you know, you talked about, like, all that Chicago has to offer, of course, but tell me a little bit about, I know obviously you have a background in architecture, in Chicago's architecture, um, but the food, architecture, parks, neighborhoods, what about all of these things make Chicago special? Well, I think what's really incredible, to think of our restaurants. You know, we partner with the James Beard Foundation Award, and that is because we are a foodie town, and we just finished Chicago Gourmet. And then for architecture, you know, we have Open House Chicago coming up next weekend, great way to go out and explore the city, but we have world-class architecture. People come from all around the world for that. And then even just our hotels. You know, we had so many hotels on the top 10 list, and that is just really a, you know, testament to what we have to offer. And then, of course, we can talk about the Art Institute, the Shedd Aquarium, the Mexican Fine Art Museum. I mean, we have so many museums that are just incredible. Attractions, you know, we just opened up this incredible bar at the top of 360, the, you know, former John Hancock um, Observatory. So there's just, like, this real diversity that people just love here to come and explore it. And then 77 neighborhoods. Uh, incredible. And they've all got something to offer. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be Day of the Dead, you know, uh, and there is so much to go on in Pilsen right now, but then you can go to, you know, Rogers Park and experience authentic cuisine. I was just reading about a new Cambodian restaurant. I mean, you can go to every culture in every neighborhood and experience a new cuisine or a new um, shopping experience. How would you describe tourism in Chicago right now compared to pre-pandemic levels? You know, we're 90% uh, there, almost 90%. So 2019, uh, compared to 2019, uh, we've had really great recovery. And what's happened is that we see a lot of leisure travel coming back, and we see leisure. I mean, you can work from anywhere, so why not extend it and work on uh, Friday and Monday from Chicago, and then Saturday and Sunday go play? And then our convention industry is extremely healthy, and we just finished having 86,000 people at McCormick Place for this incredible uh, international manufacturing show. 
Bleisure. I'm going to start using that word. <laughs> it like sounds it? like a yeah, cross between business great, and leisure. It? And I think what's important is that Chicago offers a lot of authentic experiences, and that's the trend in tourism right now. So when you think about it, we're we're authentic, and our people are authentic, and our experiences are authentic. Who are the travelers who are returning? Um, is it business travel, conventioneers, families, and just tourists? Well, it's uh, conventioneers are certainly returning, and they're finding that people have pent up demand to be in person. And then we have leisure travelers. Uh, there's just really, uh, they're calling it revenge tourism, which is interesting, another one for <laughs> you to put on. You know, that they're just anxious to get back out. They've had all this uh, challenges of being locked up, and now they're about to go out and really experience the cities. And families, I mean, we have. Have such a robust um, a plethora of activities for families. Business travel, normal business travelers are slower to return and so that's the market certainly that we want to encourage people to start getting their employees back to the office because that will encourage uh, business travel to return. What about hotels? Um, are they experiencing the the worker shortage that hotels around the country are, are feeling? You know, we're actually um, we're still experiencing shortages, and I think people have made adjustments to services accordingly. But we're at ninety five four percent of our hospitality workers returning, so that's really solid for us. And then hotels themselves have had the best summer ever because uh, of the demand. They've had the, the highest room rates ever. Try to get a hotel uh, during the last couple of weeks, and you would know about that. So actually their hotel revenues have been up over 2019 levels, which is great to hear. Okay, that's where we'll have to leave it. Uh, President and CEO of Choose Chicago, Lynn Osmond, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Up next, have you ever wondered about our new Chicago Tonight theme music? Well, we're going to hear from the composer right after this. A lot of changes around here lately. You may have noticed that along with our new set, technology and graphics, this week we are rolling out new theme music. And that, of course, means we've retired the old theme composed by yours truly and John Hagstrom. It had a good run. But the person behind this new music is a Chicagoan as well, Aisha Ish Dominguez. She's a classically trained pianist and vocalist and is one of the few female sound engineers in town. And here to talk about her musical journey and the new theme songs for Chicago Tonight, Black Voices and Latino Voices is Chicago's own Ish Dominguez. Ish, good to see you. We traded a lot of Zoom calls throughout this process, but it's very exciting to hear your final product. And very quickly, let's just take a quick listen to it. All right, there's the main theme right there that folks are going to associate with Chicago tonight for years uh, uh, coming up. Uh, tell us what you wanted to convey with this theme. Um, one thing I definitely want to convey is trust. Um, uh, Chicago tonight is a um, long-standing program that I grew up watching, my family members watch, um, and just um, being able to relay that feeling of trust and knowing that what's coming behind this music is something that you can rely on. And you know, this was a long process. There were a lot of calls, as I mentioned, where people were like, all right, make this section legato. All right, maybe some horns here, maybe some strings. So tell us about your process. So um, just from the beginning, um, I definitely thank the team there um, leading me through the project and uh, guiding me um, through the pathways. Um, I just sat down originally and just um, saw, saw what came naturally um, with me knowing the brand um, and knowing the show well. Uh, I just uh, let, let it come out naturally and basically from there um, I worked with uh, Jay, yourself, uh, just to be able to come to what we're here today. All right, and in addition to the main Chicago Tonight theme song, you composed uh, the songs for Black Voices and Latina Voices. So let's quickly listen to the Black Voices theme music. All right, Isha, what did you want to convey here? The little saxophone in there, slight variation. Yes, so when it came to the uh, varied uh, compositions, I just wanted to bring that special element that um, each of the cultures bring. Um, saxophone is something that is uh, well known in the Black community as far as jazz and other uh, genres. 
Um, so just bringing that little special element just gave it a little um, flavor, if you will. All right, speaking of flavor, you added a, a Latino flavor to Latino voices, so let's quickly take a listen to that. So a little bit of classical uh, or uh, Spanish guitar in there. Ish, you have such a broad palette here. You, you're classically trained. Uh, you've got modern and pop and hip hop elements in the music that you create. Uh, tell us how you got interested in doing this. Um, basically, uh, I grew up, um, I was drawn to music uh, just from a young age, um, learning uh, piano in church, uh, being self-taught up until my college years uh, where I went to Central State University and I minored in piano performance. Uh, so I studied classically there. And just from there, uh, my passion grew for music and um, all of the uh, modern music that I listened to, I just jumped right into it and um, pretty much work on all styles of music. And as I understand, this is your first TV news theme. So tell us uh, where we might hear some of your other pieces of work. Um, I work with commercial music as well as film. Um, so I have pieces uh, with uh, on Netflix and different movies and uh, as well as TV ads and things like that. So um, kind of all, all over the spectrum of as far as the music. All right, Ish Dominguez, a rising star in Chicago music. And again, congratulations on the fantastic new theme music. We're very excited about it. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. And up next, we check back in with Nick Blumberg, who's reporting live tonight from Chicago's Hyde Park community. But first, we take a look at the weather. And now we check back in with Nick Blumberg, who spent the day in Hyde Park as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Hey, Nick. Hey, Brandis. I'm here with John Murphy of the Hyde Park Kenwood Coalition for Equitable Community Development. Thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to see your focus on Hyde Park. Well, tell me a bit about uh, some of the work that your organization focuses on in terms of maintaining Hyde Park's diversity, both racially, economically. Well, as People are probably familiar with the signal characteristic about the university, about the Hyde Park is the existence of the University of Chicago here and now. But about 15 years ago, we began to recognize that the diversity, both economically and racially, of the community was beginning to change. And so a lot of that was related to the economic issues. So we began an effort to try to ensure that as new developments came into the community that they were required to include affordable housing units. We worked with Alderman uh, and Preckwinkle and, of course, uh, uh, the uh, Fifth Ward Alderman that you just interviewed. <laughs> so uh, that was the first effort. Then we moved on to issues that included trying to invite people into the community. Uh, we worked with the CHA and HUD to designate Hyde Park as an opportunity zone so that we could have, uh, or a mobility zone as they call it, to have people who could move into the community with housing choice vouchers that would be able to maintain them even though the rents in Hyde Park would be higher than those in other areas. Well, I want to ask you about housing. I mean, as some of the development came through, how did that affect the housing stock, both in terms of rental housing and in terms of property prices? Well, we've had kind of twin issues going on. We've had the development of three or four major uh, upper income style apartment units or condos. And we've had the University of Chicago begin to remove more students from the community, bringing them back onto campus by building more dormitories and the like. But we still have a problem that in our current population, about a third of our residents are young adults, most of them living in single room or single apartment room, bedroom apartments. 
and they're paying more than 30 percent of their income for those apartments. So uh, the issue of affordability, not only for lower income people, but even for some in the upper ranges of lower income, has become more and more difficult. Um, we were able to get one or two of the developments to commit to more affordable housing than they would normally be required through the help of the Alderman and through some public pressure. And I want to ask you, you know, you mentioned the, the university is obviously an anchor and sometimes a, a source of controversy and strife here in the neighborhood. There's also been some eyes toward the Obama Presidential Center that's uh, coming in nearby. You know, as you look at that development, what are you keeping your eyes on in terms of housing affordability, transit, all the different effects that it's going to have on this community? Yeah, we're very concerned about what's been happening in Woodlawn and South Shore with uh, developers moving in to buy vacant lots or to tear down housing. So we we coalesce with uh, groups from the South Shore and Woodlawn community. Uh, we try to stay in our own backyard as far as an organization. Uh, and there's not too much we've seen yet in Hyde Park itself, except that we expect that there will be pressure on the housing market as that center develops. And that the issues that will be of concern is what's going to happen to people in Woodlawn and South Shore. Well, certainly a lot to keep an eye on in the coming years. Absolutely. John Murphy of the Hyde Park Kenwood Coalition for Equitable Community Development, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate thank you. it. And that'll do it for us from Hyde Park. Brandis, we send it back to you in the studio. And Nick, before we let you go, earlier we talked about plans for a cancer center on the University of Chicago's Hyde Park campus. What are some of the design elements that help integrate it into the community? Well, obviously, that's going to be a cancer treatment center. There's also going to be a, a research component there. But they really want to make sure that the ground floor of this center is something that is open to members of the public, you know, to have spaces for educational programs, for community groups to come in. They've talked a lot about the fact that cancer is the second leading cause of death on Chicago's south side. So there's the treatment component, but there's also prevention components. There's the question of, you know, public health and overall healthy living, access to good food, access to preventative care. So those are some of the sorts of questions that they can look at by making sure they open their doors to members of the public. Okay. Nick Blumberg there in Hyde Park for us. Thank you. Thank you. And we're back to, and we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that is our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. You can also get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7 for our first week in review in person. In, in more than two and a half years. That's very exciting. Right and now here for in all, the right here in this beautiful <laughs> studio. And now for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.